Good morning to you. Morning. Thank you for saying good morning. I heard you, but I couldn't see you, so thank you for saying good morning. If you are a guest with us, we'd like to welcome you to Cedar Crest. And if you are online, we'd like to welcome you as well to join us as we worship the triune God together, um, focusing on his son, Jesus Christ. We are so excited you've come to join us in doing that. We'd like uh, to make a few announcements this morning. Uh, Discipleship Institute, which normally is uh, in person this trimester, is online. You can go to our church website at cedarcrest.church forward slash DI for Discipleship Institute and sign up for a class there. And when you take the courses, that's where you'll click to take them online as well. And if you do not uh, like the internet or have access to it um, for signing up, you can call the church office and sign up that way. Also, uh, next week on Sunday night, we have Cedar Roots to lead us in a night of praise and worship at 6 p.m. in this room. More details are on the webpage, but if you want to join us for a, a, a night of singing praises to the Lord uh, led by Cedar Roots, you can join us next Sunday night at 6 p.m. And then lastly, uh, nursery for parents, uh, well, not nursery for parents, but parents, nursery for your children um, starts up uh, starts back up next week. There are lots of details on our website, on the children's page for that. If you have any questions at all, you can contact our children's director, Brianna Parsons. All right, at this time, we will turn it over to our worship team to lead us in corporate singing. Thank you, Chris. Uh, would you stand with us if you're able to begin our time of worship? This is from Psalm 103. Bless the Lord, O my soul, O Lord, my God, you are very great. You are clothed with splendor and majesty, covering yourself with light as with a garment, stretching out the heavens like a tent. You lay the beams of your chambers on the waters. You make the clouds your chariot. You ride on the wings of the wind. You make your messengers winds, your ministers a flaming fire. I, or should I say we, We'll sing to the Lord as long as we live. We will sing praise to our God while we have our being. May our meditation be pleasing 
to him, for we rejoice in the Lord. Let's pray together. Father, you are great. You are majestic. And we are not. Lord, we're small. We're sinners. And yet this great God, Lord, you've come down and humbled yourself. You came in the form of man and died our death on the cross. Lord, we thank you for that, that we may praise you. Lord, that our meditation, our thoughts would be perfected in Christ. God, we love you so much. We thank you for a relationship with you. We thank you for the opportunity to sing praise to your name with our brothers and sisters in Christ. Lord, as we do that, would you be glorified? Would we fix our eyes on you? Would you be the object of our affection? We give it to you, trusting you that you will do it. In the name of Jesus, amen. Let's behold our God together. Come behold the wondrous mystery in the dawning of the King. He, the theme of heaven's praises, robed in frail humanity. In our longing, in our darkness, now the light of life has come. To Christ who condescended, took on flesh to ransom.
name of God in our place. Sing to our Jesus. You came from heaven's throne, acquainted with our sorrow, to trade the dead we owe. Your suffering for our freedom. Savior say, thy strength indeed is small, child of weakness watch and pray, find in me thine all in all. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Say a crimson stain, he washed it by his snow.
stand in him complete. Jesus died my soul to save, my lips shall still repeat. Jesus paid it all. That Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. Redeemed of the Lord, would you continue with me as we worship our great God in prayer? Let's go to him. Father, what truths were just sung in that song, that your son paid it all for us, that he displayed through his entire life and at the cross that he is infinitely worthy to take upon the sins of your people. Lord, that he didn't just have nails in his hands and feet, that he didn't just have a crown of thorns around his head, that he didn't just have to carry a cross up to the hill of Calvary, but Lord, that he also, in addition to all that, bore the wrath, the just punishment that we deserve for all eternity upon himself so that we could be made right with our God, even while we were still enemies, even while we were still sinners. Thank you so much, Lord for saving us through Christ. Thank you that we have the comfort in knowing that Jesus has paid it all. And Lord, it, we know that it is that gospel, your good news, that will make a difference in our culture. And Lord, there's so many things going on in our world and society right now, from racial injustice to the problem of abortion to this pandemic and the ways it's affecting different people economically and physically and emotionally and Lord I just pray that you would use your church you would use Cedar Crest the local expression of it here in Allentown to replicate to show people that good news that Jesus paid it all through the way that we love people through listening to people through bearing their burdens and comforting them and pointing them to repentance and faith in the Son Lord use your church here to make a difference because the gospel is the only thing that will shape and change our world. No political agenda, no president, nothing but the gospel of Jesus Christ and the kingdom of God. So use us, we pray. Father, I also pray for Jim Van Omer and Lord and for his health. Father, I just pray Second Corinthians on him, that the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction, would comfort Jim and the Van Omer family in their affliction with the comfort with which they themselves are comforted by God, Lord. And as he shares abundantly in Christ's sufferings too, would he share abundantly in his comfort as well. 
And Father, we ask for wisdom for the doctors to be able to find out what is going on in this situation and that you bring physical healing, but most of all, that you glorify yourself and you draw him closer to you. Father, I also pray for anyone else that is sick within our church family. Lord, may we be carrying church to the Van Amerens and to these people. Would the comfort that we've received from God, would we bring that same comfort to our brothers and sisters? Would we mourn with them as they mourn in their affliction and look to the Savior together? And Father, I thank you for our outreach person of the week, Haley Ott, Father, and for the desire you put on her heart to preach Christ in Shamani villages where there is no gospel witness. Father, thank you for that heart ambition you've given her. And Lord, I just ask that you would use her and her team to advance the gospel among Shamani peoples. Lord, right now they are um, in a limbo stage where because of COVID they have had to step back from the ministry. But may they trust in the God who is always ministering and is taking care of his church. And Lord, I pray that even now you be working in the hearts and preparing Germani people to receive the gospel by faith and be changed, just as you have changed us and Haley. And Father, I pray for our homebound of the week, Laura Hargrove. Lord, be her portion and her cup. Be her refuge and her strength in this time. As she's not able to gather with us, would she still feel the comfort and presence of you through watching online? And Lord, would you put it in our people's hearts to go and visit her and to be there to have sweet fellowship with her. Father, I pray for Mallory Pierre, Lord. Thank you for bringing her to the University of Pittsburgh, Lord, and thank you for all that you are doing for her, for her labor of love and her steadfastness of hope in Jesus. I pray that you be with her in her studies, that you'd empower her with your spirit, and that she would be a light on her campus for the glory of Christ. Father, I pray for our brother Dean as he is going to proclaim your word today. Lord, would we not leave without being changed? Please, God, use your servant to proclaim Jesus Christ and to proclaim the reconciliation that we have with you. And that, Lord, if there's someone in this room that doesn't know Jesus, would you bring him or her to faith in Christ and comfort and equip your saints? And Father, I pray now as we give of our tithes and offerings, Lord, or may have given at a different point, Lord, would we give freely? And without compulsion, we give because we count it as our Lord Savior does, that it's more blessed to give than to receive. Lord, be with us and equip us and sanctify us and lead us closer to your Son as we continue our time of worship and song. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand again if you're able to continue to worship our God.
on high with Christ my Savior and my God with Christ my Savior and my God
Well, good morning. My name is Dean Ressler. For those of you who don't know me, I'm one of the missionaries of, of the church here. Um, I should mention that we served in the island of Bonaire in the Southern Caribbean for 24 years before coming here. That we're, we're working here at the, at the home office. I mention that because we're going to, I'm going to mention something about that later on in, in, the, in the sermon. Today we turn to Philemon chapter 1, and we want to read verses 17 to 25 as we get started. Philemon chapter 1, verses 17 to 25, just before the book of Hebrews. <laughs> So if you consider me your partner, receive him as you would receive me, him referring to Onesimus. If he has wronged you at all or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, write this with my own hand, I will repay it, to say nothing of your owing me, even your own self. Yes, brother, I want some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I write to you, knowing that you will do even more than I say. At the same time, prepare a guest room for me, for I am hoping that through your prayers I will be graciously given to you. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends greetings to you, and so do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Every language has what we call idioms. Imagine what a non-English speaking person thinks. I mean, that's not his, his mother tongue, but second, second language. When he hears some of our idioms, like raining cats and dogs, or pay an arm and a leg, Barking up the wrong tree. Or how about this one? Egg on his face. Or uh, when we came to the States one time, my wife isn't from the States originally, and, and someone told her that she, he's going to put a bug in someone's ear. You know, <laughs> what? <laughs> a bug in your ear. Well, that's another idiom. It's interesting, well, as, as we study the text here, the, there's a popimental language idiom that came to my mind that I couldn't get it out of my mind as I was studying it. It's interesting studying the, the New Testament, all the one another's in the New Testament. You know, there's, there's love one another, serve one another, um, receive one another, greet one another, etc. All kinds of different one another's. The text here, I believe, implies another one. It's not stated, but it implies, put your hand in the fire for one another. And this idiom basically means taking a chance or risking it for the sake of someone else. It, it implies putting yourself at a disadvantage or danger for the benefit of another person. Maybe you, you could think of an English idiom that, that fits that. Don't tell me it now or else you'll ruin the whole sermon. But, <laughs> uh, you know, I, I haven't been able to come up with one. We put our hand in the fire, you know, risking it, taking an advantage, a disadvantage, take, a disadvantage for ourselves and danger for ourselves. We put our hand in the fire for people that we love, like our children, our grandchildren, maybe a friend, maybe a, a, a neighbor. But there are times that we need to put our hand in the fire for fellow believers. And Paul definitely put his hand in the fire for Onesimus. Onesimus was a runaway slave. He ran away probably as far as he could to Rome in a large city, hoping to get lost in that city. And there somehow or other, we don't know how, but somehow or other he got in touch with Paul. We don't know, maybe he was thrown into, into prison with Paul. Maybe knowing that Paul is a friend of his master, Philemon, maybe he sought out Paul and went to, to talk with Paul. Paul led him to trust in Jesus Christ as his Savior. And Onesimus began to grow in the Lord, and the Lord transformed Onesimus' life. And he did all that he could to help Paul. We're not told 
when Onesimus revealed to Paul what he had done to Philemon. Paul's counsel to Onesimus, nevertheless, even though it's not stated here, Paul's counsel was clearly, stop running from your past. You need to face it and deal with it in the right way. And that would mean to humble himself and go back and, and, and ask forgiveness of Philemon. We're not told whose idea it was for, Philemon, for Onesimus to return to Philemon. We're not told if it was Paul or Philemon that came up with the idea. We're not told about Onesimus' inner struggle because he definitely must have had an inner struggle. Go back all the way to Philemon? This was a huge decision on Onesimus' part because we don't stop and think about this, but from Rome all the way to Colossae, that's as a crow flies, it's 1,100 miles. And back in that day and age, you know, that's a long journey, at least a month, or, or probably more than that. Tychicus accompanied Onesimus on his journey. And what a blessing Tychicus must have been to Onesimus to, to be his traveling companion. What Onesimus was going to do was scary. And each day, as they took closer and closer to the city of Colossae, his fear and trepidation would have been growing. He's getting closer to his master's house. And Tychicus was there to encourage him, to comfort him. In addition, this was a lengthy trip, and a lengthy time like that provides many opportunities for Onesimus to talk himself out of going back. I mean, there might have been times on, on the trip that Onesimus said, hey, I'm not doing this. I'm going back. And Tychicus was there, used by God, to encourage him to stay on track, to do what he needed to do. We know sometimes what God wants us to do in certain cases, like to confess a sin and ask for forgiveness of someone that we have offended. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The heart is deceitful and desperately wicked above all things. Who can know it? And we easily, our hearts easily talk ourselves out of going back and confessing. We make all kinds of excuses. We have all kinds of arguments for not doing it. Well, you know, it wasn't that big of a deal after all. Or, you know, he was also to blame for it. Or it, there could be, you know, we... we, we we shift the blame, we minimize things, and we excuse ourselves, we justify ourselves. Or am I the only one that has a deceitful heart? <laughs> no, that I try to talk myself out of doing it. Maybe there's someone here that realizes that you need to go back and confess to someone, to humbly seek their forgiveness. First Peter chapter 5, verses 5 and 6 says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time, he may exalt you. My dear brothers and sisters, this verse is very true. If you humble yourself, God will exalt you in due time. God keeps his promise. And when we go back and confess a sin, God is faithful to keep his promise. Tychicus and Onesimus had a very important document with them. It was a letter from Paul. I have a sneaking suspicion that Paul read his letter to Onesimus before they left on the journey. And it wouldn't surprise me at all if on many occasions that Tychicus said, Onesimus, let's pull out this letter from Paul again. Let's reread it. Because it was such an encouraging letter that Paul was sending to Philemon on behalf of Onesimus. So let's get to the text now. Verses 17 to 25 is a section that we're going to be looking at. Verses 1 through 3 is a salutation. Verses 4 through 7, that's what Pastor Crane dealt with a couple of weeks ago, and that's appreciation. It's commendation of Philemon. Then last week, Alex Hartram 
dealt with the appeal, verses 8 through 16. And now we come to the action. What, on the basis of everything that I've written, what action needs to be taken, both on the part of Philemon as well as Onesimus? And so we'll look at the action and then we'll look at the conclusion today. Paul mentions four action steps in these verses here, in verses uh, 17 through 22. What are the action steps that Paul suggests? Well, the first action step is reception. Reception, verse 17. So, if you consider me your partner, receive him as you would receive me. Interestingly, Paul had written 16 verses before he asked for anything. He didn't ask for anything up until this point. Out. Now he says, receive him. Receive Onesimus. Accept him. Welcome Onesimus. And he uses a word, so if you consider me your partner, that word is related to the Greek word koinonia that we know so well, or the word fellowship in, in English. Paul probably meant it in the sense of fellowship in the work of Christ. Philemon had somehow or other been involved in Paul's ministry. And the implication is, look, Philemon, both you and Onesimus, both of you are partners in my ministry. Philemon, receive Onesimus as my partner in ministry. Receive him as you would receive me. Paul is basically saying, Onesimus is my personal representative. No, receive him. Welcome me in the same way that you would welcome me. Clearly, Paul is putting his hand in the fire on behalf of Onesimus. Now, this letter is obviously written to Philemon. But when we go back to verse 2, we could see that he's not only writing to Philemon. He's also writing it to Aphia, Archippus, and notice this, to the church in your house. Paul is challenging the whole church congregation to receive Onesimus, that he comes back. Not just Philemon. The whole church needs to receive him. Paul was speaking from personal experience. There was a time in Paul's life that he was rejected by the church. Acts 9 verse 26 says when he came to Jerusalem, he was trying to associate with the disciples, but they were afraid of him, not believing that he was a disciple. Prior to this, Paul had been a persecutor of believers. And so they were afraid of him. They did not accept him. But good old Barney, Barnabas, he comes along, he believed in Paul, and he, he introduced Paul to the believers in Jerusalem. Barnabas obviously put his hand in the fire for the apostle Paul. And now Paul is putting everything on the line for Onesimus. So I ask a question, do we truly receive people into our congregation? Do we truly welcome them into our congregation? As I mentioned, we were missionaries on the island of Bonaire in the Southern Caribbean for many years, a tropical island, and in the tropical island, all the windows and doors are open. I mean, that's just the way you live. And we got a new neighbor from the Dominican Republic, a prostitute. And she played her music irritatingly loud. Now, that's not unusual. Many people play their music loud and the whole neighborhood could hear. But she was right close to us. And so this was really loud. And... My wife told me one day, I'm going to go visit her. And she went and visited her. And when she returned, I could hardly believe my ears. Not only was she wide open to the gospel, right then and there, she accepted Jesus Christ as her personal savior. Now, it was a challenge following up with her. She had a lot of baggage, but the Lord patiently changed her. And believers often struggle to welcome people like this, with, with a past like that, into our fellowship. But we need to be accepting, welcoming, receiving people. 
No, we welcome the person. Yes, they have baggage. Yes, there's, there's, there's sin that needs to be dealt with. That will, that will happen in time. But it's, the important thing is their relationship with God. Not their past, not their place in society, not how much money they have or don't have, not their fame or lack thereof, not political affiliation, not their race or gender. Paul called upon Philemon, as well as a church, receive Onesimus. Don't worry about the past, receive him now. So that's the first action step. The second action step is restitution. Verses 18 and 19. Verse 18 says, If he has wronged you at all or owes you anything, charge that to my account. Paul had heard Onesimus' side of the story, but he had not heard Philemon's side of the story yet. And Paul was wise enough to know, I don't have the whole picture here. He is not saying, you're right, you're wrong, or vice versa. He's not doing that. Proverbs 18, verse 17 says, The one who states his case first seems right until the other comes and examines him. Onesimus may have believed that he was wrong by running away. And also what was common in that day and era was that a slave, when they would run away, they would steal from their master so that they could finance their flight. And possibly Onesimus did that. Paul never says Onesimus stole. He doesn't say that at all. He doesn't say how Onesimus wronged Philemon. On the other hand, that's Onesimus. On the other hand, Philemon, well, he may have believed those things are wrong, but in addition to that, maybe Onesimus was a highly skilled laborer. And as a result of him running away, he lost a great deal of income. Also, Philemon may have believed that Onesimus needed to compensate for time lost due to his running away. I mean, Philemon had never said, you know, here, Onesimus, here's a paid vacation to you. He never did that. Paul did not suggest to Philemon to overlook the slave's misdeed or to ignore his debt. But apparently, Onesimus was unable to pay for the damage or loss that he had caused. And so Paul says, if he has wronged you or owed you, owes you, charge that to my account. Wow, this is, this is amazing. An astonishing statement. The Apostle Paul is saying, no, I'm giving you an IOU. I owe you, Philemon. Paul is really putting his hand in the fire on behalf of Onesimus. And then verse 19, Paul goes on to say, I, Paul, write this with my own hand. I will repay it to say nothing of your owing me, even your own self. But that first part, I write this with my own hand, I will repay it. Even back then in the first century, having a document in someone's own handwriting carried greater weight in, um, you know, and legal validity. And this sounds like a legal promissory note back in that time. Paul didn't want anything to stand in the way of Philemon's welcoming Onesimus back. He accepted to pay restitution on behalf of, Phil of, of Onesimus. Now, what is restitution? Well, a definition of restitution, we could say, is to repay for loss or damage that you have caused. A man falsified figures on his income tax so that he didn't have to pay anymore. He sent it in. And sometime later, the IRS received a letter from the man saying, I can't sleep. I'm sending in a check for $89. I will send in the rest if I cannot sleep anymore. That's not restitution. 
Restitution is full restitution. Have I truly repented of my sin if I don't make restitution when it's necessary? What about you? Do you have a skeleton hiding in your closet or more than one skeleton? Restitution is essential in a case where you've done damage or loss to a person. Now imagine, imagine that I stole $100 from you. And I come back to you and I admit to you that I stole $100. I profusely and repeatedly apologize and assure you that I have truly repented and it will never happen again. And I beg you to forgive, you, forgive me. And then I leave. What would you think? Right? You'd be saying, where's my $100? Restitution is essential. To say nothing, Paul goes on to say, to say nothing of your own me, even your own self. It's unknown how the church of Colossae started. Paul, um, according to scripture, according to the scripture text that, that we have, he never visited Colossae. But he did spend two years in the city of Ephesus. The city of Ephesus was a major, a major city. Colossae was, was rather small. And Colossae was about 100 miles away from Ephesus. And as a result of Paul's ministry in Ephesus, Acts 19 verse 10 says, All who lived in Asia, that's modern day Turkey, all who lived in Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jew and Greek. Philemon may have visited Ephesus. Maybe he was on a, visit, a business trip that he went to Ephesus, and there he heard Paul, and he talked with Paul, and he came to know the Lord through, through, through the apostle Paul. Paul used his spiritual father relationship with Philemon to nudge him to accept another spiritual son. Onesimus is a spiritual son. Philemon, you too are my spiritual son. I'm both of your spiritual fathers. So, you know, forgive him. Accept him as your brother in Christ. Paul indicates that Philemon's spiritual indebtedness to, to Paul far outweighs Onesimus' indebtedness to Philemon. Philemon's indebtedness should really cover, easily cover Philemon's, uh, Onesimus' wrongdoing, is what Paul is basically saying. Well, the first two action steps is to receive. Secondly, restitution. The third one now is reconciliation. And I want to say reconciliation plus, because that's what we have here in verses 20 and 21. Reconciliation is not specifically stated here, but it is clearly implied here and more verse 20 yes brother i want some benefit from you in the lord refresh my heart in christ what does he mean by refresh my heart in christ well in verse 7 he had talked about how philemon had refreshed many believers many in christ and now he's saying, do the same thing for me. How is he going to do that? Well, verse 21. Confident of your obedience, I write to you, knowing that you will do even more than I say. Interestingly, Paul doesn't give Philemon any commands. He doesn't say, Philemon, do this. He wants Philemon to act voluntarily. But he wrote the letter in such a way that Philemon realized, well, if I go here, no, that's not right. If I go, that's not good. If I go here, that's not good. And so Philemon will come to the conclusion, this is the only thing that I can do. That's the way the letter is written. And Paul expects Philemon to do what he says. Do the right thing, Philemon. 
Paul is clearly telling Philemon, don't just receive Onesimus back as a slave. When he comes back, Philemon, don't just, don't say, well, it's about time that you came to your senses. I should whip you. Get back to work. Don't do that. No, no, no. Paul clearly told Philemon to accept Philemon, not as a slave anymore, but as a brother. Accept him as a brother. In Paul's mind, however, that is the bare minimum that Philemon could do. He could do more, but not less than that. And Paul goes on to suggest that Philemon should do even more. Lavish grace on Onesimus. He says, knowing that you will do even more than I say. The word more here is the Greek word from which we get the word hyper. Over and above is the idea. Paul is encouraging Philemon to go above and beyond just receiving him as a brother. Now, what would be hyper in this situation? What would be above and beyond? Well, is Paul suggesting to Philemon to free Onesimus? Very well, could be. Emancipation would certainly be above and beyond. And possibly, Paul is thinking that, Philemon, I want you not only to free Onesimus, but I want you to release Onesimus to come back to Rome and be with me and minister to me. And by the way, I would like for you to pay his expenses so he could get back to Rome. Would that be above and beyond? <laughs> Absolutely. No, Paul is basically saying it would be countercultural, Philemon, to forgive and be reconciled to Onesimus. It would certainly be countercultural to accept him as a brother. But it would be unthinkable, unthinkably countercultural to free Onesimus and maybe to go back to minister with Paul. But that's Onesimus, that's what I'm pleading with you to do. Paul is appealing to Philemon to prioritize his Christian relationship, his relationship with God over the human relationship, over the cultural, the societal way of thinking. Philemon, you are a Christian first. First and foremost, you are a Christian, not a slave owner first. Therefore, do the right thing. Go above and beyond. And this applies to each of us. If you have trusted Jesus Christ for salvation, you are a follower of Jesus Christ first. First, before everything else. You have other priorities. You have God's priorities. You're not an employer or an employee first. You're not an athlete first. You're not a neighbor first. You're not an American first. You're not a friend. You're not a parent. You're not a husband or wife first. You are first and foremost responsible to Jesus Christ and to what he says. And that's totally countercultural. The claims of Christ on our lives demand a totally different culture for the believer. Not an American culture, not the culture that you grew up in, but God's culture. And we need to adjust our lives to that. Well, the third action step that Paul is saying is be reconciled. The fourth action step that Paul mentions here is prepare a guest room. Prepare a guest room. Verse 22 says, At the same time, prepare a guest room for me, for I am hoping that through your prayers 
I will be graciously given to you. Paul was hoping to be released from Roman, from the Roman imprisonment. And when that happens, he went to visit Philemon. Now just put yourself in the sandals of Philemon. How would Philemon see this? Uh-oh, Paul is going to come and check up on me. He's going to see what I did, how I treated Onesimus. And Philemon didn't want to be red-faced when Paul came to Colossae. And so this is a subtle way that Paul is saying, Philemon, do the right thing. Well, let's move on to verses 23 to 25. This is the conclusion that we have to the, the whole book. Verses 23 and 24, what we'll look at first, just the first part of verse 23. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends greetings to you. Epaphras was probably the pastor of the church of Colossae. Um, we don't know for sure what all was going on, but he was probably the pastor there. And Paul calls him my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus. We don't know if Epaphras was in jail for the sake of Christ at that, at that point in time. Maybe it was before that that he had been in prison for the sake of Christ. We don't know that. Or maybe Paul was speaking metaphorically about that he's, he's a prisoner to serve me as I'm in jail. We don't know that. But Paul says, Epaphras sends greetings to you and so do, secondly, Mark, Achippus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. Now in the Greek, the word you could be singular or plural. If you have King James Version, it will often use ye for plural instead of you for singular. Um, but here, the word you here is singular. Epaphras, Mark, Archippus, Demas, and Luke, they send greetings to you, Philemon. Sending greetings to other believers was common back then. But I think that Paul had something else in mind by saying this. These five fellow workers may be another way that Paul is encouraging Philemon to do the right thing for Onesimus. These five fellow workers were probably aware of what was going on with Onesimus because Onesimus had been with them. Onesimus would have shared with them what was going on, that he's going back to Philemon. So they would have known. And Paul is basically saying, these five fellow workers here, they know what, what Onesimus is coming to do. And so they too are going to be watching what you do, Philemon. That could be a hint that's, that Paul has given Philemon. I want to draw our attention to two of these fellow workers briefly. First of all, Mark. Mark was with Paul. This story is also a story of reconciliation. Mark had accompanied Paul on previous missionary trips. However, when the going got rough, Mark abandoned them, left Mark, uh, Paul and Barnabas high and dry as they continued on their missionary journey. And so Paul, when he had it, when he was time for his second missionary journey, he said, no way, I'm not taking Mark anymore. He left us high and dry, forget it. But Mark had such promise, such, such potential. And Barnabas took him under his wing and said, I'm going to help this guy out. And so Barnabas put his hand in the fire for John Mark, and he went to the field with him, mission field with him. And Mark changed and became a valuable fellow worker of not just Barnabas, but of Paul. Now we have John Mark back with Paul that he had received him back. He's seen that John Mark has changed. In the past, Paul could have said about Mark the same thing that was said about Onesimus. Formerly, he was useless to me, but now 
He indeed is useful to me. Paul could have said that about Mark. He is now very useful to me. On the other hand, there's a second person that's mentioned in this list, and that's Demas. Demas is mentioned three times in Paul's letters. And every time that he's mentioned, he's mentioned somehow or other connected with Mark. Demas too was one of Paul's fellow workers. He too had potential. But as far as we know, he finished poorly. Just before Paul's death, Paul wrote, Demas, in love with this present world, has deserted me. Demas, in love with this present world, has deserted me. Mark failed and was restored. And as far as we know, he finished well. Demas failed, and as far as we know, he blew it. He did not finish well. There may be failure in your life, past failure. There may be things in ways that you've blown it. But God is a God of the second chance. And you cannot undo your past, but with your eyes focused on Jesus Christ, you can finish well. Demas had the potential, but didn't, because he loved this world. And as I read that verse, it struck me, wow, do I love the world? All of us could love the world, love the things of the world, that we don't put Jesus Christ as priority in our life. And then verse 25, to finish off this, this chapter, or this book, Paul says, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. And by the way, you're here is the Greek plural, your. Paul is extending greetings to everyone. Grace, I should say, grace to everyone, to the whole church. Now, I wish I could say at the end of this book, and they lived happily ever after. <laughs> but we don't know. We don't know what happened when Onesimus got back to Philemon. We don't know if Philemon did exactly what Paul said. But it is interesting that 50 years after this, that Ignatius, one of the early church fathers, wrote about the bishop in Ephesus, and his name was Onesimus. Is that the same Onesimus? We don't know. Could be, maybe not. Barnabas had made a difference in the life of Paul. He had put his hand in the fire for him. He also put his hand in the fire for John Mark. Paul had made a difference in the life of Onesimus. He put his hand in the fire for Onesimus. Is there someone for whom you need to put your hand in the fire for them? One more observation before we leave this book of Philemon. The letter to Philemon contains a beautiful picture of what one, the supreme one, who put his hand in the fire for us, Jesus Christ. When Adam and Eve sinned, the human race ran away from God in totality. Holy God requires holiness, perfect holiness, to be able to be reconciled to him. And that's an unpayable debt. We cannot pay that debt. Because we are sinners, we can't pay that debt to God. And God's only alternative is to be separated from us for all eternity by sending us to hell. But in his love, Jesus Christ, like Paul, Jesus Christ said, I'll pay restitution. I will pay for their sin. I will take all their sin on me. And so he took all of our sin on himself, although he was perfect. He was holy, 100% holy. And now he offers to transfer his holiness to us because he took our sin on himself. 
He offers that gift to each one of us that we could be freed from that unpayable debt of sin. But we have to receive that gift. And it comes down to each one of us. Will we receive that gift that God is offering to us through Jesus Christ, through what he did on our behalf? I trust that each one of us today will say, yes, I've done that. Or yes, I want to do that today. I want to have that debt gone from me. I want to be reconciled with that holy God. I want to have that relationship with him, to be restored like Onesimus and Philemon. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your goodness to us that is beyond comprehension. We can't understand why you would pay this astronomical debt that none of us could pay. And yet you willingly did it because you loved us. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your goodness to us. And may we respond to you by accepting that gift, that hyper gift, that above and beyond gift that you offer because you put your hand in the fire for us. We thank you for your goodness. And I pray that we will do this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with me as we close our service by singing and remembering Jesus and what he did to pay that debt in our place. Before the throne of God above, I have a strong and perfect plea, a great high priest whose name is love, whoever lives and pleads for Dean, thank you, everyone. Uh, Dean, his challenge is put your hand in the fire for one another. That is our challenge for this week, right? It may cost us something we don't know what it will cost, but it costs Christ his entire life. So let's pray. 
God, we thank you that we can join in and we can worship you this morning through song, through prayer, through uh, the sermon. So, Lord, I pray that as we leave this building today, that we worship you through our lives, Lord. And, Lord, you know where relationships need to be restored. Guide us and protect us through those. In your holy and precious name, Jesus, amen. All right, uh, we have a great day outside, right? Let's go and enjoy the outside. Good to see you, and hopefully see you again next week. God bless.